We read together from Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And if you have, yeah, Matthew 22. Jesus again used parables in talking to the people. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He invited his servants to tell the invited guests to come to the feast. But they didn't want to come. So he sent other servants with this message for the guests. My feast is ready now. My bullocks and prized calves have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. The invited guests paid no attention. I went about their business. One went to his farm, go to his shop. While others grabbed the servants, beat them, killed them. The king was very angry. So he sent his soldiers who killed those murderers and burnt down their city. Then he called his servants and said to them, My wedding feast is ready, but the people I invited did not deserve it. Now go out into the main streets and invite to the feast as many people as you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike. And the wedding hall was filled with people. The king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, the king asked him. The man said nothing. And then the king told the servants, tie him up hand and foot, throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and grind his teeth. Jesus concluded, many are invited, but a few are chosen. Many years ago, in a land far, far away, they lived a very rich and powerful king. His kingdom was Persia. His name was Ahasuerus, and his wealth and his riches seemed to know no limit. And at the beginning of the book of Esther in the Old Testament, we find that for 180 days, he held a feast to which he invited many people in order to show off to them all of his splendor and wealth and riches. But nothing, not even that, can top the banquet or gospel feast that the Lord has prepared for us. And this wonderful parable about a wedding banquet had an immediate application to the people listening to Jesus at that point in time. But it also has a continuing relevance to us because that banquet is still prepared. It is still ready. The invitation is still there. The invitation is to you and I. Because we see that the Lord has prepared a banquet. And as we look at this parable this morning, the banquet really represents all the blessings of the gospel. The banquet feast represents everything that God has provided for us in His grace in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of our sins. Cleansing for our conscience. Acceptance with the Holy God. Peace with God. Adoption to be the children of God. Freedom to come before the throne of grace in every time of need. The gift of His Spirit to live within us. Everything that is there within the Gospel is represented here by a magnificent wedding banquet. Matthew Henry says it represents the privileges that we enjoy today as well as what we will have one day in heaven. 
John Gill, who many people haven't heard of, who was a predecessor of Spurgeon, he says it's not about the end time glory, but the wonderful provision of grace in the gospel. To quote Spurgeon himself, this gospel feast is pardon for the past, renewal for today, and glory for the future. All of this is expressed in the image and picture of a magnificent banquet to celebrate a wedding. And we need to understand God has prepared that banquet for us in his wisdom. You see, a king knows how to prepare a banquet, especially one to honour his son. And so God, the Almighty Creator, surely knows how to prepare not just a banquet, but the banquet to top all banquets ever. And in Romans 11, when Paul is coming towards the end of outlining and explaining this marvellous gospel, he just bursts into praise and he says, All the depth of the riches and the wisdom of God. His ways are beyond searching out. We cannot fathom them all. Do you ever see that film? It's a bit old now. Far and Bride. Yeah, a few nods, a few laughs, a few smiles. It'd be nightmares. Because when it came out, I had a daughter who was about 10 or 11, and I thought, oh my goodness, is this what it's going to be like? Because if you've seen the film, you know that there is uh, a wedding planner who is brought in. And he has all these outrageous, ridiculous ideas. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just hope my daughter is not getting ideas here. It didn't seem really to be wisdom, it would seem to be more crazy. But that was a part of the point of the film. But as we look at the banquet that God has prepared, as we think again of the salvation that God has prepared for us in Jesus Christ, ah, there we do see to wisdom. Amazing wisdom. Wisdom in what he has prepared. Because God has prepared everything that men will be needed for salvation. And wisdom in the way in which he prepared. He said in his mind before he even created the world. He began to share it with us through his prophet. He set it all up perfectly in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. God knows what is best. God knows the best way to provide it. And in His wisdom, He has done so in Jesus Christ. God prepares the banquet in wisdom. God also prepares this gospel banquet for us in the riches of of his grace. See in this parable, the king makes a fine dinner. The message he sends out, as we find it in verse 4, is uh, my oxen and my fattened calf have been slaughtered. So nothing but the best. And nothing is held back here. It's a fine banquet. Table spread with everything good, everything best. Much more as we think about the gospel, as God prepared it in the riches of His grace toward us. We are men and women who at times have said no to God. God has said to us, this is the way to live and to be. And we've said, no, this is how I'm going to be. And yet God in his grace has prepared this gospel for us. Invites us to come, to take a seat and to know his forgiveness. To know his complete cleansing. To know his 
full acceptance in Christ. More than that, to know that he makes us his own sons and daughters. God prepares this gospel grace, not only in wisdom, sorry, this gospel blessing and feast, not only in wisdom, but in his grace. The Lord has prepared his banquet at divine cost. Only the best was good enough when the king made this feast for his son. But as you read, did you notice that all the expense lies with the king? This is not a party to which you need to buy a ticket. This is a banquet to which you are invited. Everything that is prepared is prepared at the cost of the king. And again, as we think of all the blessings of the gospel in Christ, they've been prepared at divine cost. There's a cost to forgiveness, there's a cost in reconciliation. There's a cost to the gift of eternal life. And just as the king in the parable, so even more wonderfully, God gave his best. God gave his only begotten son. And in giving his son, God gave himself. The gospel, the gospel of amazing grace, magnificent banquet provided and given at great cost. That cost, as Peter says in the beginning of his first letter, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Gospel is costly business, and yet, to you and I, to the sinner, it costs nothing. There's nothing we have to do or pay. Because as we sometimes see, the price is paid. So come, let us enter in. This then is the wedding banquet, the gospel feast, prepared by God through Christ. Friends, have you taken your seat? <coughs> Begun to receive from the table that's prepared. Have you taken that forgiveness? Have you received that peace of God? Do you know that you belong to Him? And you can say, My Lord and my God. Sometimes in England, the wedding feast sort of lasts for a day. In Israel and in some other cultures, it, it maybe lasts for a few days. The beginning of Esther with the king of Persia, it lasted for 180 days. But the banquet that God has prepared, it doesn't last just for one or seven or even 180 days. It's a banquet prepared for every day. And so we come not just one time to receive forgiveness. In those moments when we know we messed it up again, we come back again. We don't just come one day to receive adoption as the children of God. We can come every day and eat from the table that our Heavenly Father has prepared for us. We don't just come one day to know peace with God. Day by day we live in that peace. So our call is not to a banquet for a few days or even 180. Our invitation is to a banquet day by day. 
So I ask you, not only have you taken your seeds and received first that forgiveness, but do you come back again and again? What I mean is, do you take some moments day by day to remember and just thank God for what He's done? That's taking our seat again. Do you spend some moments to praise and to pray? That's taking our seat again. Do you spend some moments to read the scripture and find your heart and your faith nourished as it speaks to you of God and His greatness and His grace and the blessings of the gospel? That's taking our seat again. Because the gospel banquet that God has prepared so wonderfully is a banquet to which he invites us to come. The banquet represents the blessings of the gospel. Then the invitation is the call to receive them by faith. The immediate relevance of the parable was to the people who were listening to Jesus at that point in time. And the occasion is just shortly after he's entered into Jerusalem on uh, the, the triumphal entry. Palm Sunday is the word I was looking for. And all the greeters there, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. And yet the religious leaders have been going, what is all this noise and nonsense about? Tell them to shut up. Jesus tells this parable. You see, the invitations had gone out some time before. And now the invitation is repeated because it's, we now ready. And what Jesus was saying to the people is, you know, God has invited you, the Jews, to his covenant and his banquet again and again and again. <coughs> He's called you back to it again and again through his prophets. And yet how often have you been like those invited here? Don't want to know. Got something else to do. We may wonder about why the king needs to go and have these people killed. It seems a little strange to us. You know, if we have a party and we invite people and one or two people say no, well, we're disappointed because we wanted them to be there. We don't go and shoot them. Well, I hope we go. <laughs> but Jesus is just as a parable. It's a great honour if a king would invite you or I to his bank. And so, think of just as a story. To ignore the invitation. This is what he says. They, they, they didn't want to know. They paid no attention. They just ignored it. And they got on with what they were doing. The people listening to Jesus in that culture would have been angry as they listened. Never mind the king. They would have been angry as they listened to the story. Because to reject the invitation was not just to reject an invitation, it was to reject the king himself. But it's not just simply a story. It illustrates Israel's long history. That over and over again, they turned away. They would not listen to the prophet. And yet God had been so patient with them. And yet they had killed his God. That's why the king, the parable reacts in the way he does. Not some fit of rage or anger. But after centuries of patience, God is saying, I'm now going to bring my gospel and it's going to be opened up to the world. And that's what happens. He sends his servants out. The king has prepared this banquet and it is not going to go to waste. The banqueting hall is not going to be left open, uh, um, empty and silent. And he tells the servants, go back out again. Just go out into the streets. Anybody you find, 
Whoever they are, wherever they've come from, whatever they've done, tell them to cut. Because he's ready. And whoever they are, whatever they've done, they're welcome to my back. That's the message, the invitation of the gospel. It comes to all of us. You know, whoever we are, male or female, young or old, rich or poor, black or white. Whoever we are. And whatever we've done. You know, some of us may say, well, we've lived a good life. Some of us may carry things that we hope nobody else ever knows. The brilliant thing of the gospel is invitation is to all of us. There's not one of us sat here this morning that needs to miss out. Because God's invitation is to every single one of us. The lesson we need to take from the parable is that we must be careful that we are not foolish enough to pay no attention. Because the gospel does warn us that if we reject the invitation of God, if we refuse the gospel that he has prepared through the blood of Christ, then the day will come when we will not have that opportunity anymore. And we will be shut out of the glory and the wonder of heaven and its banquet. The Lord has prepared his gospel banquet. He invites every one of us to come and to join in. The third thing I want to say is that the Lord prepares garments for us to wear. I hope this isn't sexist. Ladies, when you get an invitation to the wedding, what's the first question in your mind? <laughs> yes, what am I going to wear? <laughs> and you go to the wardrobe and you open it, no, that's too old, no, that's too bright, no, that's too sh short, no, 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 no whatever. I'm going to have to go and get something new. Because, and what happens if you buy a dress and somebody else, yeah, you know exactly what I'm going to say, somebody else has bought the same dress. Oh. We go to a wedding, to a party, we go dress for the occasion. In this wedding banquet, somebody has come without wedding plans. He didn't follow the dress code. We're not told how he managed to sort of slip in under many guests, I suppose. But he did. The point of the parable isn't about what we're actually wearing on our body, it's about the state of our heart. And the Lord is saying to us, we can't just come to God any way that we choose. We don't just come to God on our terms. We come receiving the blessings of the gospel that he has prepared for us. The people who had come into this wedding hall were the men and women who had been invited off the streets from them. So they probably haven't had time to go and buy uh, a new suit or a, a new dress. They were just coming back from work. Maybe getting off uh, at the end of a long journey. Or maybe just sat out on the streets begging. Who knows? And so it's very possible, and commentators discuss this point, and, and they have a difference of opinion, but I think it's really possible that the king provided clothes for them. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament, we don't have time, we can find one or two examples of that. But there must be a reason why the king says to him, How did you get in here? Without the right clothes. Those commentators who do see the king as providing garments go on to say, It's like this, we can come into church, maybe occasionally, maybe regularly. We can stand and sing the songs, we can say amen, give the prayers, look at the watch while the preaching is going on, thinking, oh, God, I 
much. It's time to finish. Can amen in the right place? And yet, not truly receive God's salvation. Because it's not enough just to sit here or stand the right moment. What counts is our receiving an invitation and trusting in the provision of God. And that's what the roads, the garments, represent here. God provides that for us. Isaiah says, He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Well, there used to be a song with those words, I think, didn't there? Isn't it a wonderful verse? He's clothed me. He has clothed me with garments of salvation and with a robe of righteousness. When Paul writes his letter to the Philippians, he says, Look, I'm not trying to find a righteousness of my own because I can never do that. I want that righteousness that comes from God that I receive simply by faith. And friends, we do need a righteousness to stand before God. Forgiveness is absolutely wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. It wipes out my sin and my guilt. Sets my conscience free. But I also need to be righteous before God and I still don't have it. Except in the words of that hymn that we sung last Sunday. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and everything in him is mine. I'm alive in him, my living heaven, clothed in righteousness divine. The righteousness that God gives to us. As it says in 1 Corinthians, he, Christ, is our righteousness. And that is how we can stand before the Holy God. So good this morning, all of our songs thinking us and helping us to look up and to understanding in the holiness of God. To be in awe of God. To be humble before God. And as I said when I stood up, how marvelous that we can even be anywhere near the presence of God. How marvelous we can say, Lord, draw me close to you. And that can be our prayer because God clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. And so we're fit to take our seed at the right moment. To receive the blessings ourselves and then to invite others to come and share them too. May we not neglect our seed day by day. And may we not neglect the task 